You know, so it's interesting. This is the second time that I'm recording today on Monday. This is going to be a Tuesday morning podcast release. As of the time of this recording, it is 11.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time out here in California. Earlier, I recorded on Monday morning for a scheduled Monday afternoon release. And right before I was about to hit upload on YouTube, right before I was about to wash my hands, be like, all right, I'm done for the week as far as my podcast recording is concerned. An interesting turn of events happened for the Minnesota Vikings. This is Realistic Randy of the Mediocre at Best Sports Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. And I want to start with this. Sometimes in life we make mistakes. Sometimes the actions that we decide to take can lead to negative consequences. Does that mean the sky is falling? No. Does that mean, does that make us failures in life? No, absolutely not. And I'm not trying to get philosophical on you guys at all. But the point that I'm saying is, it's not about oh, I made a mistake, I'm a piece of crap, whatever it is. It's all about what do you learn from it? Do you grow from it? How are you in the future not going to make that same mistake twice? And that brings me to my point. Rick Spielman has been a remarkable GM. He really, really has, if we're being quite honest. But his Achilles heel has always been holding on to bad draft picks for far too long. And fast forward to Sunday. Daniel Carlson was a train wreck out there. He missed three field goals, two of which were in overtime. And then if this was Rick Spielman of last year, Rick Spielman would have got right up on that podium and would have came up with every excuse and to justify why Daniel Carlson still deserves to be on this roster. He really would. That's what he's done in the past. But to my surprise, less than 24 hours later after that game, Daniel Carlson got cut. The Minnesota Vikings waved Daniel Carlson in favor of, to my surprise, Dan Bailey. I went on that rant on Sunday. I'm like, dude, I don't care if you got to call Dan Bailey. I don't care if you got a bad Kai Forbath to come back. Daniel Carlson cannot be the kicker for this team. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you're wrong. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you made a mistake. There was no reason to trade up in the fifth round to get him. But to his credit, I got to give credit to Rick Spielman. He he recognized this, that debacle, the the Vikings should have won that game. But you know what? Ended up in a tie. He said, you know what? I made a mistake. I'm going to learn from this. Let's go out and get Dan Bailey. So kudos to him on that. I believe that I'm a fair dude. If you're good, I'll talk about it. If you're bad, I'm going to talk about that too. And my rule of thumb is, once you're no longer on the team, I won't talk about you in a negative light anymore. I won't do that ever again unless you're Blair Walsh in the preseason with the Seattle Seahawks pointing at Mike Zimmer and the the Minnesota Vikings about, I made a field goal in the preseason, damn it. Well, you still suck and you're a bum and you're without a job. But there you go with that. And Matt Khalil, you go to the Carolina Panthers and you talk about, Oh, the coaching staff. This coaching staff demands ex- excellence, and I've never had that before. Well, you still suck, too. You're a bum. You're still collecting a check. You're scamming Carolina. Good for you. I'll, I'll give you credit for that. I actually envy you for that. But I won't talk about him anymore. Daniel Carlson, I've said my piece about him. I wish him well in the future. Now, moving forward, as far as additional turns of events, or actually, really, just one more, the Minnesota Vikings also signed. Well, actually, Dan Bailey, he's pending a physical before he gets signed. But, They've also added Algic Robinson, wide receiver. I believe he last played for the San Francisco 49ers. They added him to the roster. What does that mean for Laquan Trent? Well, I don't give a damn as long as he's not on the field. I never want to see number 11 out on the field again. Here's what I've said about Laquan Trent well from day one. Number one, every time he's on the field, you're handicapping your offense 10 on 11. And even worse, when you're throwing the ball to him, you're risking an interception because he simply can't catch the ball. He's not a reliable pass catcher as a wide receiver. I don't know how he's made it this far in the league. But anyway, you're risking an interception every time you throw it to him. Now, I've seen a couple of comments on social media as far as, you know, Kirk Cousins, why is he still throwing the ball to Laquan Treadwell when he's dropping the ball? And you know what? I think that's a fair question, but here's what I'm going to say. I'm actually going to side with Kirk Cousins on this, and here's why. Ever since his days with the Washington Redskins, and even now in these two games with the Minnesota Vikings, you see that Kirk Cousins, he's not worried about one dude getting all the targets or one dude needs to get the touchdown. He's all about making the right throws at the right time at the wide open receivers. As open as they are, he's going to throw you the ball. He doesn't care about your status. That's how he's always been. And to his credit, and bless Kirk Cousins' heart, Laquan Treadwell was open on those times that he threw him the ball. Laquan Treadwell just couldn't catch it. If there's anyone to blame, it's the coaching staff. Why are you trotting this dude out on the field who can't catch worth a damn, whose best attribute up to this point is blocking? Why are you doing that? That Don't blame Kirk Cousins. Blame the coaching staff. As far as Algic Robinson, I think you could do a little bit of a better upgrade. Josh Gordon, he got traded. 
to the uh, New England Patriots. Maybe there's still Des Bryant out there. Call Chad Beebe up from the practice squad. Stacey Coley. I don't give a damn who it is as long as it's not Laquan Treadwell. I am 100% good on that. So, as far as I'm concerned, his time with the Minnesota Vikings, his, his career with the Minnesota Vikings is finished at this point. Whether he continues on from there, we'll just have to see. But, God, but I'm telling you, I was about to cuss right now. This dude does not need to be on the field ever again. But as far as two positives that I'll take from this game, despite it being a tie, number one, the tie itself. So, 29-29 is the final score. Green Bay Packers, Minnesota Vikings at Lambeau Field. Now, here's what I'm going to say about this. I'm disgusted that it was a tie. Minnesota Vikings should have won that game. But here's what I'm going to say. If you're going to tie, if you're ever going to have a tie in the regular season, at least it's with the Green Bay Packers. At least it's with a contender in your division. So the two teams that are neck and neck in the NFC North right now that are going for the NFC crown, as far as what's projected, is the Green Bay Packers and the Minnesota Vikings. So it's not like one has an advantage over the other. If you were to, let's say, tie with the Buffalo Bills and the Green Bay Packers were to win at the same time at the same week, and if you find a way to tie or lose to the Buffalo Bills, everybody should be fired. But... If you were to tie with an AFC opponent or an opponent outside the NFC North division and the Packers were to win that week, suddenly you'll be looking up to the Green Bay Packers a half game ahead of you until you meet again. So luckily, basically, it evens out for both teams. It is what it is. The second positive that I'm going to take away from this, what have I always said about Case Keenum all last year? When things are going according to plan, when the defense is shutting down the opposing offense, when the receivers are producing, when the running game is there, Case Keenum can ride that wave like nobody else. When things don't go according to plan and you're forced to match quarterback play with quarterback play, Case Keenum is not that guy. We saw that in the NFC Championship game. The defense was trash, and Case Keenum could not keep up with Nick Foles, who was also a backup quarterback. Fast forward to Sunday. The defense outside of the first possession was trash. I understand that uh, there was a couple of times where the defensive line made a couple of plays. But for the most part, Aaron Rodgers had all the time in the world to make throws. Xavier Rose got carved up in that game. Everybody was pretty much awful on defense on Sunday. But you know what? Who was the one guy that kept us in that game? Who was the one guy that put, if it wasn't for this one dude, we would have lost, let alone the fact that we tied. We would have lost that game straight up. It was Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins is the reason why we did not lose that game. When the defense was just getting pushed around and the defensive line was getting pushed around and our secondary is just getting lit up by Aaron Rodgers, basically hobbled on one leg the entire game, Kirk Cousins was the guy that was making those big boy throws. That's 75, I believe it was, a 75-yard bomb touchdown to Stephon Diggs. Case Keenum, in his wildest dreams, would never make a throw like that. That touchdown he threw, to Adam Thielen at the end of regulation in between two Packers defenders where Adam Thielen landed on his butt in the end zone. That's fantastic. That is some great stuff. Everyone says all the time, Kirk Cousins, at the end of games, he chokes. But I've always said this, with these weapons that you have, any quarterback can look good. It's all about what regular talent, what raw talent do you have when you don't have those types of receivers. Kirk Cousins was balling on Sunday. He played his ass off, and it's a shame that we didn't win that game to cap it off. But that's the one thing that I'm going to take from that. And speaking of sorry defenses, Anthony Barr, and those who are new following me, welcome to this conversation. If you've been following me for a while, you know what I'm about to say. Anthony Barr, I believe he's lazy. I believe he's half-hearted as far as effort-wise. On a consistent basis, he's not consistent enough effort-wise on a game-by-game -game basis. That touchdown pass to, at, to uh, Devontae Adams, that play. Now, Xavier Rose was covering uh, Devontae Adams on that play. I don't know what the hell he was doing. Anyway, Devontae Adams made a move on him, and Anthony Barr was actually chasing him. He was actually four or five yards away from the end zone. Anthony Barr was chasing him from behind and made a half-ass, lazy-ass attempt at a tackle. And Devontae Adams said, dude, what the hell are you doing? Did a simple juke move and walked to the end zone scot-free. That was lazy as hell. The play before that, Anthony Barr went up to rush the passer. He went up to rush Aaron Rodgers. And what happened? He got neutralized on the pass rush attempt by a running back, Jamal Williams, number 30. And you're a, line, you're a linebacker, bro? This the dude that y'all say, if we lose Anthony Barr, our defense goes to trash? Are you serious right now? The same guy that you said deserved a big contract over Stephon Diggs? 
Oh, don't don't worry. I ain't forgot about y'all. Are y'all serious right now? And we're not talking about some chip block that Jamal Williams gave. We're talking about basically he lined up on him like an offensive lineman, squared up with them one on one and neutralized them. Was had no effect on the play whatsoever. Anthony Barr, man, we can replace him. It is what it is. Now, last thing that I'm going to get to. Let me get to these Packers fans. Last thing I'm going to get to. Let me get to these Packers fans real quick. So, oh, that that game, that roughing the passer play, that roughing the passer penalty on Clay Matthews was BS. It was a clean hit. I don't understand that. Oh, really? Let's take a time travel. Let's travel back to last year. Anthony Barr lays a legal hit on Aaron Rodgers. Lays a legal hit, clean hit. And, oh, my God. Oh, we need to change the rules. This is ridiculous. Aaron Rodgers out for the year. This is unbelievable. Aaron, uh, Anthony Barr is a dirty player, sending him death threats and hate mail all throughout the season and all throughout the offseason. And this is ridiculous. NFL, you need to do something. Change the rules. This can never happen again. Okay, fine. The NFL Rules Competition Committee, they change rules. They say, all right, fine. You're right. We don't need to lose Aaron Rodgers for the year. Our ratings go down. We need to keep Aaron Rodgers in the game, damn it. And, uh, oh, they adapted, they adjusted the rule. No more than 50% body weight of a defender on the quarterback. What the hell kind of crap is that? Oh, my God, no more driving quarterbacks into the ground. I'm like, dude, I get the idea you're trying to prevent injuries, but it's football, bro. Dudes are going to get hurt. This Aaron Rodgers rule that you're doing is completely soft. And Packers fans, oh, well, too bad. Aaron, Anthony Barr should have never did that hit, and this would have never this would have never happened. I totally understand why the competition committee did this. Deal with it. Then throughout all the preseason, all those flags, 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 flags galore that they throw on those quarterback hits. Oh, well, I'm like, yo, this is crazy. This is soft, man. You're going to cost some teams some games and possibly some seedings when it comes to the playoffs. Packers fans, that is too bad. This is the Aaron Rodgers rule. You need to deal with it. Our quarterback needs to stay. And it's funny. It's so funny because after you lost Aaron Rodgers, you you went through the Brett Hundley experiment, right? And then after that, you think to yourself, okay, we're not going to deal with this dude anymore. We're going to let him go. What happens? You see teams like the Philadelphia Eagles, Nick Foles, the backup quarterback, Quarterback to Carson Wentz, he can lead the charge. Last year, Case Keenum backing up Sam Bradford, he could lead the charge in case Sam Bradford gets hurt. And then after going through the Brett Hundley experiment, you go out of your way and say, we are never going through this again. We need a viable backup. You trade, you trade, you trade for Deshaun Kaiser. Are you serious right now? Deshaun Kaiser, that's who's your backup quarterback now? But anyway, fast forward past the preseason. Well, too bad. This is just the new NFL and deal with it. Aaron Rodgers needs to stay healthy. End of the second, or not the end of the second half, before the end of the first half, Eric Hendricks lays a clean hit on Aaron Rodgers right after he throws the ball. Immediately after he throws the ball, Eric Hendricks goes in for a hit, leads with the shoulder, hits the center of the body. No big deal. Boom. Roughing the passer call. 15-yard penalty. Extends the drive, and that ultimately leads to a field goal to end the first half. Putting the Green Bay Packers up by two scores, I believe, 17-7 to to end the first half. And then, okay, fine. I didn't hear anything from Packers fans then. And then we fast forward to the end of the second half, the final possession by the Minnesota Vikings. Kirk Cousins throws a bomb, I believe, to Stacey Coley. Gets intercepted right after Kirk Cousins throws that ball. Clay Matthews goes in with the same type of hit that Eric Kendricks did. Boom, roughing the passer penalty. Oh, my God, this is ridiculous. The league is soft. What are we supposed to do? It's a bang-bang play. What is these defenders supposed to do? Stop their momentum at the drop of a hat, really? And this dude, Clay Matthews, this dude, Clay Matthews, you got some nerve, dude. This dude said, quote, I have so many emotions kind of running through as far as what a terrible call it was. But at the same time, I don't know what else to do. I don't know. You let me know. You tell me. Did I put pressure on him? I thought I hit him within his waist to chest. I got my head across, put my hands down. And to call it at that point in the game is just unbelievable. Well, that is just fantastic. We didn't hear nothing from y'all when the rule got changed. We didn't hear nothing from y'all throughout the preseason. Didn't hear a damn thing from y'all when Eric Kendricks got that flag call on him, that penalty rough in the passer call on him. Clay Matthews does the same thing. And, oh, my God, the sky is falling. This is so unfair. The league is soft. They did this for y'all. They did this rule for y'all, baby. Y'all the ones that were bitching and moaning, saying, oh, do something about it. They did something about it. But guess what? When you do something for one player, it happens to the rest of the league. 
Deal with it, just like you told us, right? Deal with it. The fact that y'all are sitting there crying, bitching and moaning this whole time for this, and then got the nerve to be like the refs helped y'all out. Oh, what about that that BS offensive pass interference call on Devontae Adams? Well, what about all those non-holding calls that your offensive line had on the Minnesota Vikings? What about that? Oh, so, oh, I get this. So the Minnesota Vikings, we're supposed to get all the flags, but you guys, none whatsoever. Are you serious right now? You want to have your cake, eat it too, and own the whole damn bakery. Are you for real right now? Man, sit your asses down. Man, take, take a shower. Wash your hair. And use some of that Kobe Jack cheese shampoo y'all use out there. Sit your asses down. Stop crying. This is the NFL. This is what y'all wanted, right? This is what y'all wanted? Deal with it. We do this once a week. Mediocre at best sports podcast with Realistic Randy. YouTube, iTunes, Twitter, at Realistic underscore Randy. You can follow me on Facebook. At realistic underscore <laughs> Randy, Jesus Christ, messing this up. We will see you next week, baby.